Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I'm joined by the amazing Chaz Presley. Chaz, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing today? Dude, I am doing very well. Very excited to have you here. Uh, but before we talk about why you're here, Chaz, I would like for the people that don't know you to get to know you a little bit. Um, you started as a stuntman, actually, from the Windy City. Um, your love for music and horror comes from your uncle, um, letting you share in his taste for heavy metal music, along with whatever horror films were new to the local video store at an early age. So um, was your uncle close in age to you at the time? Uh, yeah. So if I was about three, between three and five, I would say he's probably about 13, 14. So about 10 years of age. And I figured he was one of the, you know, when you have a cool uncle like that, he's usually the one that was like the late child and you were the early yes. child at the other end. So mm -hmm. um, when you guys are close in age to that, even though it is uncle, it's almost like a cousin or brother bond at that point. So um, it's really cool for him to, you know, tag you along and kind of teach you all about music and movies at an early age. Definitely. I was, I was very, yeah. uh, very, very gifted in, uh, in having that, that, you know, that type of relationship with him. Right. Well, I mean, and then obviously you go and you're doing multiple avenues of business. You were fortunate enough to travel all around the world. Um, a trauma school graduate, Uncle Lloyd, uh, yep. their trauma school. <laughs> oh, that's sick. Um, <laughs> you are passionate about uh, underrepresented stories and champion championing. I can never say that word. Championing. I right, fuck it. I tried. Yeah, you got uh, it. Misfit filmmakers. Um, so, um, you know, you've been. A th How long have you been a filmmaker for now? Uh, let's see. I started uh, approximately in 20, 2010, 2011, roughly, uh, just kind of dipping my toes in the business. Um, and then after that, kind of really, uh, but I've always been involved in doing music and production and, and everything like that long prior to that. But that's really when uh, locally I got started getting paid for some of my, the work I was doing. So that's about that time period. And where can people check out some of the work that you've done? Uh, for the most part, most of the uh, best way to get a hold of me is uh, in my my information is going to be on Instagram. It's uh, Chaz Presley, C-H-A-Z-P-R-E-S-L-E-Y. Uh, that's the best way to get a hold of me. You could also search me on um, on Google, IMDb. Uh, I'm on there also. So pretty, pretty, pretty easy. Yeah, the good thing is you guys don't have to go far looking for those because I have all his links down in the description. So you can follow him on social media, become a part of that family as well. So um we talk about you know you being an independent filmmaker how many films would you say you've worked on up to this point um including ones that have been scrapped and uh not gone to release i would say over 30 roughly roughly to say and that's including ones that i've just consulted on also uh, mm -hmm. a big portion of since especially 2020 i do a lot of consult consultation with international films that are trying to get into the american market so i'll get paid and i won't get credit for some of those uh some will get credit and i won't get paid it's it's hit or miss, but I would say roughly about 30 films. That's awesome, man. And right now we're getting to the very end of 2023, a year that I'm sure a lot of us would like to forget. But um, do you have anything coming up in the future that you're – I know that NDAs and stuff like that happen, but is there anything you have coming up that you're allowed to talk about at this moment? Yes, I can very much talk about the things that I am uh, in charge of. Um, well, right now I'm doing a lot of uh, commercial freelance work, but uh, that's the finance. I have two big projects coming up. One is a short film. Uh, that I'm hoping to launch the crowdfunding for, I would say in the next week, uh, it's a short film that takes place in Chicago. It's almost a love letter to Chicago uh, mixed with uh, a, an, a pop, anti-pop horror film. Um, that's coming up. Uh, hopefully be able to get funding for that within the next couple of months. And then I have a big project, which has kind of got me landlocked into my uh, where I'm at right now. Uh, that I'm working on internationally, ideally Singapore, Taiwan. We're trying to get a project. It's going to be a feature film uh, with entire international casting. Um, that's something that's been in the works for quite some time that um, is really exciting. It's more of a, a new twist on the exorcism story. That's awesome, man. And like I said, when when you are doing crowdfunding and things like that, it is really cool if you guys are able to help out. And you can do that by going to his Instagram. And if it's still funding by the time this episode is released, I will have that link down in the description as well. That way, if you guys can help out with the crowdfunding, try to help this art get made. It would be really, really appreciated. So um, I'm very excited to see that. You know, I, I love short horror films. I feel like they're very hard to do because you have to cram in so much information in such a short amount of time to keep people interested. And then obviously, you know, a new take on an exorcism thing, especially if it's all done overseas. That's amazing, man. I'm really, really hopeful that we can get that, you know, the ball rolling on that. 
and make sure that gets made in the next couple of years. I'm really happy for you. Very excited. So make sure, guys, you're following him on social media. I have that down in the description. Now, in order for you to make these short horror films, in order for you to be a part of all these different horror projects, horror had to start for you somewhere, Chaz. So now I would like to go back to the past and talk about what got you started in the horror genre, your first horror movie. And Chaz, your first horror movie was? Nightmare on Elm Street. The uh, Wes Craven uh, film, I believe, 1984 was yep. uh, the first film. Uh, there was a lot. They were pretty close to that time period, but that was the one that stuck with me. That was the one that uh, enchanted me with the horror genre and the film genre as, as a whole. And it is, to this day, one of the best horror films of all time, in my opinion. It really helped to kickstart that supernatural slasher genre. Um, and like you said, this is a very important movie still in pop culture, but... Do you remember about how old you were the first time you had seen it? Oh, boy. I believe uh, it was approximately four years old. Get Just guessing. Uh, maybe five at the oldest. Uh, and I remember it was funny because when I finished watching it, I'm like, this this guy is killing all the babysitters, basically. You know, the age of you know my babysitters, typically. I was like, I love this. This is, this is hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, Babysit me now, bitch. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, um, like I said, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, I'm assuming you watched this with your uncle for the first time? Yes. Yes. Good on you, uncle. Proud of you. <laughs> Thank you for kickstarting this love of the film. Um, th- this is a movie that, like I said, it has stood the test of time. And to this day, some of the greatest practical effects, a terrifying story. But do you remember which scene it was that affected you the most? Absolutely. One scene that not only stuck with me in the film, but has translated to my entire outlook on on film and practical effects would be the Johnny Depp bedroom scene, <laughs> to put it bluntly, uh, where uh, Nancy and Glenn are talking, uh, or I think she's trying to get a hold of him, and he sleep, he falls asleep. And that scene, uh, I've watched the behind the scenes, even as a kid, and more recently in the last few years, they released the uh, the movies that made us on Netflix. Uh, mm-hmm. basically the version of that just absolutely loved it every aspect of it and uh uh heather langenkamp was definitely a huge impact as uh on me as adolescence for sure yeah and like i said the kills in this movie are so few and far between um you really honestly have four kills throughout the whole film but each one is this is a film that's all about quality not quantity every single kill in this movie is memorable and we know that was the scene that affected you the most but would you say that that was the kill that stuck with you the most as well as the waterbed one I would say the waterbed one, yes, um, on both a personal and a, I guess, a, a, a filmmaking standpoint. I will, I will have to say the, um, the school scene uh, was something I often talked about uh, as a kid. Uh, often people would talk about, oh, how, how would, if you had to die, how would you want to die? I was like, honestly, I want Freddy Krueger to take me to school. I, I was like, you know, it's going to suck either way. I want everybody around me to be scarred and not, right. <laughs> and not be able to forget me. For the rest of their lives, man, exactly. you'll never this shit we saw in our high school, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, part of a big franchise now, you know, um, expands over, I think, 13 to 14 movies now. Um, no, 10, 10 movies, nine, 10, somewhere in that area. If you count Freddy mm-hmm. vs. Jason, I think we're at 10. But, yeah. um, which movie in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise would you say is your favorite? Uh, it's hard to go away from the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I think just the amount, what went into that being made, how difficult it was to make, as well as the odds were really against, uh, you know, Wes and Bob and um, and even Robert, you know, the connection with Star Wars. It's just, it's so, it's such a story. And it's honestly, it's a very romantic story of the love for film and storytelling. Uh, I will say, uh, unlike a lot of my, my peers who really liked, uh, you know, the earlier Nightmare films, Dream Warriors, that soundtrack, that's amazing. And honestly, the kill with uh, the puppet, puppeteer, that sound, I can feel whenever, whenever like I, I pull a muscle, that's the sound effect, you know, <laughs> of being puppeted by Freddy. That's awesome. But yeah. uh, welcome to primetime, bitch. I mean, that's um, so many things throughout the whole franchise uh, were amazing. Um, I do like Wes's new nightmare. I felt like the meta, a, a part of that, really translated to me at the point in my life where I was like, okay, I understand how film works as a kid, you know, it was like, Oh, this is spooky. This is, you know, whatever this is. But as a, 
getting into the film industry and like this is interesting the props guy you know is you know with the yeah. lead and and just and the all the aspects and getting all these these people who were playing themselves basing the movie just blew my mind in a different way that I had had not ever thought of before and like there's not even an opening title sequence in new nightmare like the movie just picks up and goes like just like it's real life. And I think that's brilliant. You know, you don't get a title card till the very end. Like after that last, you know, take, you know, the, the very last scene, Wes Craven's new nightmare, you know, like, and I think that's fucking brilliant because they were just like, Absolutely. let's make this as real as we could possibly make it. Um, and because that movie bombed, we got scream. So, you know, kind of hard to hate Wes Craven's new night. I love it personally. I know a lot of people don't, but, um, without that movie, we would have never got Scream. I'm a firm, firm believer that that was Wes dipping his wa- toes into the meta waters, and then Scream was just him diving headfirst. So, very, very, very big fan of Wes Craven's New Nightmare as well. The same as well. When I when I studied in the school, they had me do whenever we had to do book reports. It was either Robert uh, Robert England or Wes Craven. I think Wes Craven was like a, and it's been said in multiple interviews, he was a professor of film. Just the amount of wisdom that he he gave out not only to the people who are around him, but to his fans was, you know, just like you were sitting in a class and just absorbing all of this. And that, not only just his interviews, but through his films, you can even see that in the people under the stairs. It's just, yeah. there's an amount of filmmaking that's authentic and that translates beyond the actual film itself that I absolutely love. And yeah, Scream, I'm a huge fan of Scream, uh, the franchise, the roller coaster that it's become. But one thing that I thought of when I was rewatching it this weekend, uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street, there's a mask that one could argue somewhat re- resembles ghost, a very early concept of ghost face uh, in this scene where um, Nancy's mom slams the door on her and she's trying to get her to go to sleep. Yeah. I so, go back and rewatch that. Yeah, Scream fans, check that out. Let me know what you think because I, it's something that stuck with me when I rewatched it. I'm like, you know, I just watched Scream about two months ago. I wonder what's the connection here with this mask that's hanging on the wall. I mean, it could be a clown ghost you know, thing, because I know, you know, Wes was really into, I think, believe Cambodian uh, mm-hmm. artwork and dreams and all that. So that could be a play on that, but makes me curious. Yeah. And it, it's one of those things, you know, maybe this was an earlier prototype of what he was trying to do. So um, the the thing is, like, when it comes to a movie like this, um, you know, it, it we talked about the kills, we talk about the effective parts, but it's just a great movie overall. Um, do you know what your favorite scene from the film was? That that opening scene really stuck with me as far as being f- my f- my favorite visually because they went they told a lot of story without even seeing Freddy. There's so much in the sound, there's so much in the aesthetic, the coloring, the lighting um, that they really did with you don't see Freddy and until like the claws come by, and I think that was really cool. I actually was fortunate enough in the last year to see it um, at a live amphitheater, uh, the playing of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, which was a phenomenal getting a bunch of Freddy fans all throughout a place in Michigan. And it was just blew my mind to a new love for the, for this film. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you said, you, you have all these different moments of the opening and Freddy's only on screen for what, seven minutes of the film. Because, yeah, roughly. yeah. Because of makeup and budget and stuff. And he's still that iconic of a villain. So um, we know what a nightmare on Elm street means to you being your first horror movie and how much you dig this film. But I do want to throw a little bit of curveball at you here for a second. My little buddy Ghostface is here, and he has a question for you. What's your favorite scary movie, Chaz? Uh, what is your favorite horror movie of all time? I'm going to go with the easy answer and go Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I can be persuaded on an occasion um, to go with uh, definitely um, a, a big portion of my uh, early childhood was Japanese cinema. And the uh, the Japanese horror films uh, were definitely very influential on my upbringing. My uh, great grandmother used to we watch Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and then whatever was on Swingoolie would be playing. And a lot of times it was those B international films that I had no idea what was going on, but I was like, "This is so interesting. It's a story that I've not heard before." And growing up, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in uh, right on in Chinatown in Chicago, which was really small at the time. Now it's huge. Um, mm. so growing up with that and interacting with different parts of not only Shaw Brothers films, but, um, Japanese horror and really getting appreciation for that, I think kind of influenced my, uh, my career. But yeah, Freddy would definitely be my favorite scary movie. Uh, there's definitely been some movies that have been 
very innovative since then, but it's hard to be the original. Yeah, I completely agree. And like, a, if you take out the ending with the dumb Freddy car, I hate <laughs> the Freddy car so damn much. Or the blow up doll mom getting sucked through the window. It's, it's perfect. If you if you take that out, it's the perfect horror movie in my opinion. So um, I really appreciate you coming out and hanging out with me, man. But before I let you go, we always go back to the same question. We're going to go back to Nightmare on Elm Street. And what we're going to do is rank this movie on a skull count. Now, Chaz, we're not ranking it on acting, production, score, direction, nothing like that. All we're doing is ranking this movie on how much it affected you on your first viewing. So, zero skulls being not effective, five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. But Chaz, what would your ranking of Nightmare on Elm Street be? Five skulls all the way. Wes Craven, Freddy Krueger. I, I just I can't go any any less than that. It felt. Uh, it, uh, it's not the perfect film uh, in, by any stretch, but what they did with that film, how it infected me personally, it was just, I can't, I can't put it in any more words. It's, it's, uh, you know, definitely five skulls for sure. Absolutely. So I know I said this at the beginning guys, but it's my show. So I'm going to say it again. I have Chaz's social media links down in the description. So make sure you're following him, not only to stay up to date on what he's doing and everything he has coming up for us. But, you know, you never know when you can help out with a crowdfunding thing. Yes, you get awesome uh, perks for helping out. But the big thing is you're helping people to create art. And that's something that can never be taken away from us being help, being helpful to that and them for creating their art. So please make sure you're following him on social media to stay up to date with that. Uh, Chaz, please don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Um, <laughs> I have one more other thing. Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I want to be the first guest. I have not, I've watched a lot of your show and I haven't heard this. You can also find me on LinkedIn, uh, Chaz Presley, film director, writer. Uh, definitely, uh, I would love to get some horror people involved with that. Uh, I do a lot of professional stuff on there. Uh, but anything, love to connect anyway, as well as anybody who's an aspiring filmmaker, actor, um, writer. You, if you have questions for me on the process, I might not know everything, but I, I'm like the Mr. Bean of I'm able to stumble into some stuff somehow. And like I was in cocaine bear uh, for three weeks. Somehow I'm able to find out these things. So if you're interested in involved in a process, getting involved, starting your own accounts for filmmaking, just reach out to me. Yes. And like I said, I have those links down in the description as well. So make sure you're connecting because like I said, we can never have too many connections and you never know when you're going to help the right person. So um, like I said, Chaz, please don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Um, everybody else, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. It helps the channel more than you know. And follow Sledgehammer Horror on social media. Our links are in the description as well. But until next time, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.